Good morning. We want to. Good morning. We want to welcome you this morning to St. Paul's Community Christian Church. We're so ha happy that uh, that you're here. And um, <clears throat> for those of you who are joining us online, we're happy that you're here as well. Uh, we want to wish all the fathers a happy Father's Day. And uh, uh, what a what a challenge it is to be a father, but what a <coughs> blessing it is to have a father who reflects the love and the care of our Heavenly Father. So uh, we celebrate that today, and we want to celebrate each one of you. Um, as we begin this morning, we're going to sing a song of standing on the promises, but it's also nice to be sitting in the premises, isn't it? <laughs> you know, sitting on the premises and standing on the promises. And for those of you at home, you're sitting on the premises too, but uh, uh, you can stand if you'd like, and we're going to sing this, uh, this hymn this morning, and we, we want to worship our Lord, and we want to be, be firm in standing on who he is and what he's done for us. <clears throat> I believe in the sun. 
in our lungs. Lord, we pray for our country as we need your breath in our lungs. We need your help. We need your guidance. We need your health. We need your blessing. Lord, we need your, your word. We need your truth. We need your love. We need your power as we walk through these days. And God, I ask that everyone who, who hears this prayer this morning would be touched. Lord God, that you would reach out and Lord, you would encourage Sick, God, we ask that you would empower them. And, Lord, bring your healing touch. Uh, God, we ask that you would calm our fears and give us strength and let us walk in your grace and in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's our prayer this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. 
It's so nice to see everybody here today. Beautiful day today. Again, happy Father's Day. Happy Child Day to God today, too. We're just so thrilled to be children of God. I don't have any more announcements, so we will continue with our service. Our scripture this morning is from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. One of uh, probably the most powerful passages of scripture that I know. Uh, it may be familiar, uh, it's life-changing when we look at it and take it seriously. So let's read it this morning. What shall we say then? <clears throat> shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been free, set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey all its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. God, we pray that you would apply this word to our hearts. Lord, touch us, speak to us this morning. Let us grasp what it says in Jesus' name. By your Spirit's help, amen. <clears throat> this morning I have a question for you to, to start with. What's your relationship with sin? You know, that's kind of a serious way to start, but it's important. What is your relationship with sin? Now, the sin in your own life. I'm not talking about the sin of others. We spend lots and lots of time worrying about the sins of others, don't we? You know, oh, you know. And sometimes it affects us, and a lot of times it doesn't, but we worry about them. But this morning, we're going to just look at ourselves. The sin in our own life. Now, what's your relationship with sin? Do you love it? Some do. Do you hate it? Or is there a mixture of both? You know, you love it, you hate it, you struggle with it. I think that's, Paul's going to talk about that in the next chapter. Um, do you feel guilty about it? Or maybe you don't even care about it. Maybe you intellectualize it or justify it. We make excuses. Boy, it's easy to make excuses for our sin and look at our, you know, our intent and not make excuses for the sins of others. Or do you try to get away with what you can without ruining your chances of heaven? 
You know, I know a lot of Christians that way. It's like, you know, I'm going to sin as much as I can to make sure that I don't miss out on too much that this world offers. But, you know, I want to go to heaven, so I'm not going to push it that far. Which is a very difficult place to live. You kind of miss out on both. You know, the backslider misses out on two things. You know too much about God to really have fun in the world. Because you feel guilty, because the Holy Spirit convicts you. But you're too much grounded in this world to enjoy God. And so there's that struggle. And I think most of us have been there at some point in time. It's kind of a part of the Christian life, it seems, that we go back and forth for a while. Or maybe, you know, you've just given up and given in. A lot of people like that too. You know what? I fought sin. And uh, I heard somebody say one time, most people don't know the real depth of temptation because they give in way before it gets tough. So sometimes we just give up and give in and say, you know what? This is what it is. Um, I want to share a little bit about my own testimony and relationship with this passage. Um, I was in a church, and the church was having a sen sense of revival. I mean, people were standing up and getting set free from all kinds of stuff, asking forgiveness. Um, God was changing lives. And at the time, I was about 18 or 19, and I was, to be real honest, I was at that stage of, you know, I was a fairly new Christian, and I really believed God, and I really, you know, I had accepted Christ because I wanted to go to heaven. But, you know, I still had the normal uh, teenage stuff going on, and, you know, I'd go out with my friends and get in trouble, or not bad trouble, but do things that I shouldn't do. And, um, but then I'd go to church, and I'd try to be a good Christian. And I was, I was pretty shy when it came to talking to people, but... You know, the Lord basically spoke to me, not audibly, but he kind of said, this has got to stop. <laughs> this has got to stop. This hypocrisy has just got to stop. I'm like, okay, God. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm ready to die out to sin. And I'm ready to follow you wholeheartedly. And I had gone to the altar a couple times, you know. It, I had a familiar spot where I went forward. You know, I used to fight it. I used to sit in the seat and say, oh, Lord, you know, because I was embarrassed. After a while, it was just like, okay, God, I'm walking the walk again. I'm head heading up front to pray. And, um, but he kind of spoke to my heart and said, you need to ask forgiveness. Because I was still in the youth group. I was one of the older kids. And I was, you know, I was fairly intelligent. So I had memorized some stuff. And I, I could pull it off and look pretty good. But it wasn't right. I wasn't right in my heart. And the Lord said, you got to ask forgiveness from the rest of the youth group for your hypocrisy. Well, you know, when you're a teenager, what other people think of you is probably more important than any other time in your life. And so, Lord, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know? But I, I did. I told him I'd basically been playing the game. And surprisingly to me, Several of them started crying. They said, you know what, me too. Me too. I'm done too. I want to die out to sin and I want to live a genuine life for the Lord. I was shocked. That was not the response I was expecting. And from that point on, <clears throat> God began to give me opportunities to speak. I'd go to other churches and I'd say, I was playing the game, and guess what? I bet most of you are too. Like, yep, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm playing the game too. God, forgive me, you know? And God anchored that in this passage because this is what I staked it on. And, and it's, if you read this and you take it just word for word, because there's really not any other way to take it, you know, a, a good interpretation 
rule is, if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. So when you can read the Bible, and it usually says what it means. There are a few illustrations here or there, but for the most part, it, means, it says exactly what it means. And it's not hard to interpret. So this morning, we're going to let God search our hearts. And Paul has just made the point, if you remember in chapter 5, that God's grace is greater than any sin. He says, Where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He said, so sin increased, grace increased all the more. So no matter what sin there is in your life, grace is greater. But then he takes the other side of this and says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And then he said, says very firmly, if you read this in the Greek, very firmly, it's like a double, uh, a double no, you know, by no means, absolutely not. That's not the point of grace, so you can keep on sinning. And this tells us about our relationship with sin. Number one, and this is in verse two, we died to sin. Paul's speaking to a church that he didn't even know, but he said, you died to sin. We died to sin. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Pretty clear. You know, how ridiculous is it to sin when you're dead? Think about that. And that's basically the point Paul is making. It's just as ridiculous for us to sin when Jesus made a way for us to be dead to sin. It's just as ridiculous, by no means. Or don't you know, and this is number two, that we were, that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. So we were baptized into Jesus' death. And he's talking in the past here. He basically said, you've already died to sin when you identified with Jesus. When you were baptized, what, what happened? You went under the water, right? That signifies burial. That's where you died to sin. And you were resurrected a new person. He said, you've already been baptized into his death. Or don't you know, he says. Verse 4 says, we were buried with Christ. And you know, a lot of times, and I think it's partly an American thing, you know, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life, you you need to accept Jesus for that plan, and that's great. We often don't think about the death involved, though. When we take on the life of Christ, we basically are saying, okay, Lord, I'm giving myself to you. I'm taking on the cross and putting to death the old nature, that person who I was without you, all the things. And Paul had built up a lot, and I'm sure these Romans had built up a lot, and he said, you know, that that goes to the cross. That goes to the cross. You were buried with Christ, You were united with him in his death. And I imagine some of the people there, they're like, really, I was? Because we don't hear that a lot. You're not often going to hear that on the, you know, the the TV evangelists and stuff like that because they're they're trying to stay more positive. Um, It's not comfortable to hear, I was buried with Christ. I was united with him in his death. And then he says in verse 6, for we know that, number 3, our old self was crucified with him. Our old self was crucified with him. When we accepted Christ, we accepted his death on the cross, but we also went to the cross with him 
The cross is for us. The cross is where we put to death that old life that was a slave to sin, that did things apart from Christ, not necessarily evil and wicked, but just meaningless and human. We were crucified with him. And, you know, that's something that we often don't realize, but if we can grasp that, it's, it's life-changing. It's life-changing. There are some, uh, some theological approaches that would look at this as what they call a second experience of grace. In other words, you receive Jesus as Lord, and the cross is, is for us. Jesus is crucified for us. And when we realize that we are crucified with Christ, they'd say that's a, like a second experience of grace. You know, I don't know that it's so much always that. It doesn't matter if it's a first experience, a second experience, or way on down the line. It's the truth. Whenever it is that we realize we are crucified with Christ, our life is going to change. We're going to be able to walk away and leave that old life behind. And God's going to show us what parts of the old life just need to die. And what parts of the old life that he's going to maybe redeem and use us as a, as a testimony. <clears throat> but you know when we go to the cross, a person on the cross has no rights. They have no future except for what God gives and it's really surrendering our rights. It's giving ourselves to God and saying, Lord, I want to be crucified. You already see me that way. I want to live that way. So that the body of sin might be done away with. The body of sin might be done away with. And many think that Paul is making a reference here. <clears throat> the Romans had had worked on torture, and they had it down to a science. One of the ways that they would torture people was they would strap a dying person onto the back of a living person. And when the dead person died, or when the dying person died, they would have to carry them around on their back. They'd be next to them. And of course, what would happen? From the sickness and the gangrene and the, you know, all the things that would happen, the living person would eventually slowly die. So Paul is picturing here the Christian, healthy and alive, dragging around this dead person on their back. And you know, when we try to play with the old life and the new life, that's pretty much what we're doing. And the deadness of that person we used to be, the old self that was crucified, you know, it starts to infect us. It starts to wear us down. Paul says, our old self was crucified. The body of sin might be done away with. We don't have to carry it around anymore. We don't have to carry the sin around. We don't have to carry the guilt around. We don't have to carry any part of that around anymore. Others may remember it, but who cares? God doesn't. And part of going to the cross is like Jesus. You know, he got to a point where he really didn't care what people were saying about him and thinking about him. He was very much alone on that cross. And sometimes, going to the cross, it feels very alone. Nobody can do it for us. But the body of sin is done away with. So that we should no longer be slaves to sin. <laughs> you know, contrary to what you might hear on the news, America did not invent slavery. It was around a long time, and it was around at Paul's time here, it actually goes way back to the Garden of Eden when we become slaves to sin. But Paul says, 
once we're crucified, we're no longer slaves to sin. We're set free. In the old nature, it was our nature to sin. Right? You don't have to work hard at it. It just comes very natural, apart from Christ, to sin. Once we're a Christian, that old nature, it goes to the cross. We're no longer enslaved. We're free from sin. Because the old nature, it doesn't call the shots anymore. You know, you hear the story of sometimes people will kind of um, talk about it as, you know, I got an angel sitting on this shoulder and, you know, the devil shit sitting on this shoulder and back and forth. And, <clears throat> you know, essentially that's the struggle of the old nature versus the new nature. <clears throat> the new nature is Christ. The old nature is who we were before that, that is very open to sin and very alive to sin, and it's natural to sin. And I guess the question is, are you, which one are you living in, or how much are you living in the old nature? And how much are you living in the new nature with the old nature on the cross? Because sometimes Christ died once for all, but I think in practical Christianity, we have to take ourselves to the cross a few times because we, we figure out a way to get down and we have to take ourselves back. There's an illustration I think that works well with this. Uh, there was a man who, um, who was into dog fighting and he would bet on dogs, on his two dogs, and he would always win. He had a white dog and a black dog. One time he would bet on the white dog and it would win. The other time he bet on the black dog and it would win. And he got it right every time because they were pretty equally matched. And finally somebody said, how do you know? How can you predict with these two dogs which one's going to win any time? He says, it's really simple. The one that I feed wins. The one that I feed wins. That's pretty much the way it is with the two natures, isn't it? The one that we feed wins. If we're feeding the old nature, guess what? And the King James called it carnal, the old nature, the carnal nature. The fleshly nature is, is probably the most accurate translation. The, the sinful nature. If we feed that, that's what we're going to live with. But if we feed the new nature, it's going to grow and it's going to be strong. But it starts with realizing, and it starts with that, that act of commitment. All humanity is under slavery, and only Jesus provides a way out. Paul's Roman audience was so familiar with this institution and how terrible it was, they clearly understood the reference. Because to be set free was an incredible thing. And that, that's the way it should be for us too, to be set free from maybe that sin you've struggled with, from that lifestyle that just trapped you in. It's an incredible thing. And he says, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Then number four, <clears throat> and this is where the good news starts. It's from verse eight. If we died with him, we will also live with him. When we die to sin, we don't just stay on the cross. We get to partake in the resurrection power too. So we identify with the cross, but we also identify with the resurrection of Christ and we live with him. But then number five, there is a decision point. And I think often this is kind of what we miss. You know, we know there's a decision point to receiving Christ. You know, there's a point where 
the old things pass away, new things have come. We've, we've made that decision to follow Christ. Whether it's so, when we're so young, we don't hardly remember it, or whether it's later in life, there's that decision point. But we don't always realize that there's a decision point when it comes to the cross. He says in verse 11, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. Count yourself. The King James says, reckon yourself. Recognize. Reckon that old nature dead. Count yourself dead to Christ. There's a decision involved. We have to really decide, am I going to be alive to Christ or am I going to stay alive to the world? And really, you can't do both for very long because that battle, and, and again, Paul talks about the battle. The bat, if you have the battle, one of the things, that, the good things about having the battle of the two natures, it means you're a Christian because if you're not a Christian, there's just no battle. You just do what you want. You don't, you don't feel convicted. But if you're struggling, the good thing is, it means that Christ is in your life and he's working. But it also means that we need to go to the cross. We need to go to the cross. There's a decision point. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its desires. Verse 12. Don't let sin call the shots. Don't let sin reign. And, you know, God does a pretty good job of showing us our sin if we ask him. Lord, show me. Because often it's not the things that we traditionally think about. It's issues of the heart. But he talks about our mortal bodies because that's where our sin takes place, right? And that's why verse six, or, uh, number six is so important from verse 13. Our body is the battlefield. Our body is the battlefield. That's where sin happens, and so that's why we have to go to the cross and count that point where we said, hey, you know what? This body of sin, it's crucified. I'm going to live in resurrection power. But he tells us how to do it. He says, do not offer the parts of your body as sin, your body to sin as instruments of wickedness. So he breaks it down. And I think this, is, this has been practical for me on a day-by-day -day basis. You know, it's pretty hard to sin without your mouth and your tongues and your hands and your feet. If you yield your body to, to the Lord, and even, you know, our mind, our brain is part of our body. So where do you let it go? What do you think about? Um, it's very practical. You know, what would life be like if your hands were so completely offered to God that they could only do things that honor God. If your tongue belonged completely to God, that you could say, as Ephesians chapter 4 says, that you only say that which is edifying, building up. And I don't mean that necessarily means you have to have the flowery, annoying speech. Sometimes something that builds somebody up is, you know, hey... A little bit of rough talk, right? You have to talk straight sometimes, but it's edifying. You're building up, not tearing down. What would it be like if your feet were so dedicated to God that they only went where God wanted them to go? A lot of times, if our feet would keep us out of certain places, sin wouldn't have the power. You know, lots of times when we have struggles, it's because our feet are in the wrong place. What if our eyes and ears were completely given to God? It'd be pretty hard to sin without using our body parts, wouldn't it? And even as our brain is part of our body, it's, it's died to sin. And in fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, 
we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. And we say, what? Now, I realize if you go around telling your friends, I have the mind of Christ, they're going to say you're crazy, you know, send you to some place. Um, and so I think we have to, yes, avoid that sense of arrogance. But, you know, we have the process of thinking Jesus' thoughts after him by the Holy Spirit. We have access to the mind of Christ. And the longer we walk with him, and if that old self is crucified, and sometimes that's the hardest part, our philosophy of life. Because without God, it's not going to be 100% correct. Even if we were raised right, there's going to be some things that need to go to the cross because it's not what God says. And so we crucify that old way of life, that old way of thinking, and we learn by the grace of God to follow the mind of Christ. So the body is the battlefield. Then he says in verse 13 and 14, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. As instruments of righteousness. Again, the King James says members, the members of your body. The, all of the instruments, all the parts of your body as instruments of righteousness, for sin shall not be your master. But the cross is the only way. You know, there's lots of self-improvement stuff. I still haven't figured out how to get on to listen to podcasts. I know a lot of people listen to a lot of cool podcasts, and they're saying, hey, oh, this was a great podcast. And There's a lot of good self-improvement stuff, and that's, that stuff's fine, and it works, and it's nice, and it's good. But there's still a cross. There's still a cross involved if we really want to have victory. The old self cannot be educated out of sin. It needs to go to the cross. It needs to die. And that's a very stark truth. We can't improve it. We can't fix it. It's kind of like, <laughs> Randy will understand this illustration. I had an old 94 van, and I'll tell you what, I put all kinds of things, and I just thought I could remake it forever. Put a new frame under it, and this and that, and finally, the whole front and that it held the wheels on, rusted out, and I welded the steering box back on. There was a time it just needed to die. There was a time it just needed to die. And a lot of times our old self is like that. We can make all these self-improvements. You know what? It just sometimes needs to die. It always needs to die if we want to follow Christ. We can't fix it up. It's beyond help. And that's why so many religious things, and even so many Christian-ish things, things that come in, you know, under the umbrella of Christianity, never really bring victory because they never really go to the cross. Without the cross, there's not the power. We have to die out to sin, and there's really no other way to have Christian victory. And it's a decision that we have to make. And obviously because of the, the COVID and all that kind of stuff, I'm not going to invite you to come forward and we won't gather people around you and pray. But we're going to sing this last song and I'm going to have you remain seated. But if you say, you know this morning... I want to die out to Christ. I want to identify with the death of Christ. Maybe I've been crucified before with Christ and I realized it and I backslid. Or maybe, you know what, maybe I never realized that this is what, I need, what needed to happen in my life to give me victory and to, get, to, to honor God. I didn't realize these things, but I've realized them this morning and from this point forward, I want to go to the cross. I want to be dead to Christ or be dead to self and alive to Christ.
If you want to do that while we're singing, I just want you to stand up. Just right where you are, just stand up as a sign to God and also as a sign to others because part of being dead to sin is we don't really worry about what others think so much anymore. What Jesus thinks is what really matters. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. And we're going to sing at the cross. And it starts out, there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies because the cross is where mercy comes. It's where we get the love. It's where we get the grace. But then the chorus says, at the, cro- the chorus says, at the cross, I surrender my life. I surrender my life. Here, arms open wide, you saved my life. Here I bow down. And what we're doing is we're saying, hey, here is what, here, the cross is a point of surrender. So as we sing that this morning, if that's your heart's desire and you want to make that commitment to, to the Lord, stand any time during, during the song and let the Lord know that and I, I will close us in prayer. And at home, if you're at home listening to this, stand up in your living room or your bedroom or wherever it is that you're watching this. God sees you. And God knows. And that's the important thing. works better when it's turned on.
Lord God, I pray for each person this morning who's making this commitment. God, I ask that you would fill them with your spirit. And Lord, from this moment on, let us live as those who are dead to sin and alive to Christ. Lord, in a world that's confused and and lost in sin, Lord, let us be dead to that and teach us what it means to be alive to Christ. God, I pray for your spirit's help, for your spirit's empowerment to to stay on the cross, Lord, that we might honor you. Lord, I ask that you would revive our lives. Lord, that you would, you would make changes that, Lord, are so infectious that everybody around us sees them. Lord, I ask, God, that you would give us a new sense of power, give us the resurrection power as we have willingly gone to the cross, just like you willingly went for us. Thank you, Lord. And we thank you for what you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to encourage each one of you. If you stood today, I want to encourage you to go home sometime today and read Romans chapter 6 slowly, carefully, and just let God apply it to your life so we can understand. Let that commitment sink in so we know what it really means and how great it is, and how powerful it is. So I encourage you to do that. So this is one of the few times I'm giving you homework. But, uh, <laughs> and I want to wish everybody a happy Father's Day, and we just pray that God would just bless you and bless each one of you, and that he would comfort those of us uh, who have some pain related to Father's Day, but ultimately that we would look to our Heavenly Father and enjoy that and and trust him you know because if you had a great father or you have a great father that gives you a glimpse of what god's like if you didn't god has everything that your earthly father didn't everything you missed out guess what he has it so either way god's a good good father and so let's honor him today Be blessed in Jesus' name. This concludes our service.